Hello and welcome to NFP Week Conversations. These are conversations each evening of NFP Awareness Week. And I am your host, I'm Peg Hensler. I'm the Associate Director for Marriage Ministries and Natural Family Planning for the Diocese. And I'm excited to, this evening because our guests are Molly and Jack Casella. And our topic this evening is adoption and foster parenting. And Molly and Jack are going to introduce themselves and share their story. They are from St. Francis of Assisi Parish in Long Beach Island. And we're so excited that they took time out of their busy schedule to join us this evening. So welcome, Molly and Jack. Jack and I have been married uh, 26 years and we have a daughter, uh, Emily, that's in her 20s. And um, she was about 11 years old and I was a nursery school teacher and Jack was a police officer and we were just going about our lives. We just had one child. We were, you know, very content with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, a family was involved in our nursery school and they had been foster and adoptive parents in Ocean County. And um, they had a baby that was 18 months old. Mm -hmm. And then they recently had gotten a newborn baby, both from the same birth mom. And after they got the second baby from the birth mom, my friend Sandy had said that their home was full. They had adopted four children. They had two biological and that they were looking for a home for the next baby that was gonna be born um, because they wanted to ensure that their kids would have sibling relationships. And Sandy just thought that I only had one child and that she just thought that we would be a good mix for it. So she approached me, not once, not twice, but many times trying to convince me that, that, that we should do this. And over time, she kind of wore me down. And then I went home to Jack saying, I don't know, maybe we should do this. Um, there's this birth mom. She has a baby every year. It's a simple process. And um, so then eventually my husband agreed. Uh, we started the process with the division um, to get licensed, which was took probably about six months. Everything, you have to do the fingerprints and the background checks, and then you have to just take some classes. It really wasn't complicated. It was just took a period of time. And um, after we finished that, we did find out that the birth mom was pregnant and that she would be due between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And this was around Labor Day that we found this out. So we were a licensed foster home and we were waiting for our baby to come home. And um, in the meantime, because we were an open foster home, we were getting calls from the foster care system in Ocean County saying, you know, we have this child, we have that child. And we just kept on saying, no, we're not interested. We're waiting for a baby to come to us um, that's already been determined that would be placed in our household. Um, and this went on for September and October. And then on Halloween, we got yet another phone call. And um, our daughter that was 12 at the time, Emily, she was there and she heard the conversation and the division said to me, oh, we have this little girl, she's three and a half years old. Um, if you don't take her, she's gonna go to a group home and I said, oh, but you know, we're waiting for a baby and we have a nursery set up and we're really not interested in taking more children. And they said to us, if you don't take her, she's gonna go in a group home and it'll only be for two weeks. So it's been a little more than two weeks. It's been <laughs> uh, 18, so it's been about 15 years. And so we said, so I was kind of hemming and hawing like, oh, I don't know how to say no, I'm not really sure. I, and my older daughter just happened to be standing in the kitchen and she was just like, say yes, mom, just say yes. They said, it's two weeks, just say yes. And she was standing there getting ready to go to trick or treating. So I said, oh, all right, okay. If you're telling me it's just two weeks. And I said, is she well behaved? And they were like, oh yeah, yeah, she's great. Um, and then after they said that, they said, well, I said, well, what time will you be bringing her? And they said, oh, it'll be a little while. We're getting her treated. She is lice. <laughs> if they had that, I think I would have said no. That was a Tuesday. Needless to say, the entire household had lice by Friday. Right. So mm -hmm. we came home uh, that night and immediately connected with all of us. 
and the dog and um you know I turned to Jack and he turned to me and we're both like this is going to be this is going to be more than two weeks and um over the next few weeks um she was actually quite sick and the division didn't know that she was sick and Mm -hmm. after 13 days and four or five doctor's appointments Mm -hmm. trying to figure out what was wrong with her just seemed like there was something kind of off um it turned out that she had a um cyst in her brain and she had a ton of fluid on her brain and she had emergency neurosurgery at CHOP and that was the 13th day that we had her and so by the time we got to the hospital with her um we were very much attached to her and now it kind of changed the circumstance that was um that she could she was going to be with us for more than two weeks because now she had a medical condition that was going to be lifelong that would affect her ability to be returned back to her birth family because the level of care that she required so it all worked out because what happened at the time at that time it's no longer run this way but the foster care system used to have regular foster parents and mm-hmm. then foster parents that were certified to take care of medically fragile children and i remember when we were in the hospital in philadelphia and she was getting neurosurgery i turned to the caseworker and i was like oh no you're going to remove her from us because we're just regular licensed foster parents we don't have the medical status and she said no 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 We're going to get you to the class. We're going to get you certified. We want to keep her in your home. So we said, great. And um, about two weeks later, we went to the class, or actually my mother and I went to the class because it was going to be me and then whoever our babysitter was going to be. And uh, Jack stayed home and watched Shade. And when we were in the class, um, the division called and they said, that baby that you've been waiting for has been born. Good news, bad news. This baby's been born. Bad news is they deemed her medically fragile because of the circumstance under which she was born. And you won't be able to take her because you're not a medically fragile home. However, I, of course, was like, oh my gosh, no, we're in the medically fragile class. We're going to be certified by the end of the day. And so they were like, great, she won't be ready to come home for about a week. So in reality, if we hadn't taken our eight, our now 18 year old and she hadn't had her medical issue, we would have never been able to get the baby. Like it all worked out. Like it was just, it was meant to happen. So in a matter of six weeks, we went from having a typical 11, 12 year old healthy daughter, just one child with no medical issues to having a newborn baby with all types of medical issues going through withdrawal, a three and a half year old that just had neurosurgery and all types of follow-up care from that and lice. <laughs> so, my goodness. Oh my oh, goodness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And I and called that's... up Sandy and I was like, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 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 Yes. So there is a beautiful article that you can actually find on the monitor's website. It was written on May 5th of, I believe, um, you know what, I'll have to find that link and I'll put it on our website when I, at the end, when I, when I share the resources, because the article is so beautiful, but you have given us so much more detail than what was in the article. This is so fascinating. So now I get to really understand the full story. And this adds even more to that. Yes. And by that, yes, I'm talking about the yes. When I think about the yes of Mary's annunciation, and how you know the angel Gabriel came to her and 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 gave her the choice, and she had to say yes. She had to she had to have make a choice. It was not automatic. She first she had to give the yes, and she didn't know what she was in for, and it was a matter of pure and utter faith. And in so many ways, your yes, you would ha- you had no idea what this yes was going to entail, and it was such. Uh, a matter of pure and utter faith in each other, in your wonderful, beautiful daughter, who is the one that gave the yes. I mean, Mary was kind of speaking through her, I feel like. And then your, um, your, your, your parish, your community of support, right? And um, it's just a tribute to the generosity of your loving home and how amazing and wonderful that is. So that, that yes is representative of so much and it has such um, significance for our Catholic faith. I think, and so, um, so you mentioned some of the some of the challenges of health challenges that were kind of unexpected, and um, so how long? So you you said your daughter had a cyst. Now, 
I do have to say it's interesting because my husband about 12 years ago started developing neurological problems and we've now been married for 39 years. Thank the Lord he's, he's healthy right now. He actually went through emergency heart surgery a year ago. So we've been through a lot, um, but he had something called a colloid cyst that was there from birth. And he had neurosurgery at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and um, he was developing hydrocephalus and that was causing. So the same thing, it was water on the brain. Um, it, would have, it would have been fatal if it had not been removed. It was not a cancer assist, but um, so I know exactly what you're talking about, except that it was your, your daughter. Um, but I also want, I want you to talk a little bit about what it was like for you when you said, you, I read in the article that you said, that having a newborn baby, you, when, you're at, when you had your, your biological daughter, when you had your daughter and you know, you're so tired, you're, it's, adjusting to new motherhood, new fatherhood is just, nobody can prepare you for it. You know, no. the sleeplessness, the worry, now you're responsible for another human being. But in your case, Molly, you shared that, what an incredible experience to pick up this baby and, and not have, that no, you you're not recovering from childbirth, and you're relatively not sleep deprived. You have you have you're relatively rested, <laughs> and so you have yeah. this amazing experience of having this newborn baby. But of course, now you already have the the three year old in the home, correct? And and you've already yeah. and you had already been through the the surgery. But but I'm really struck by the fact that um, uh, seeing we're going to talk a little bit more about God's handprint on all this. I'm really struck by the fact that had it not been for your uh, JD's um, health issues, then you would have you would not have had your other daughter who is it's Lily. Lily, yeah. Lily. And then I, yeah. um, I would say because that kind of happened in that period of in a small period of time, which was six weeks, and then um, years later, four years later, um, Lily had a biological sister born that we said yes to as well. So it really, it was a cascade. If we hadn't said yes to Jade, we wouldn't have any of our girls. And so um, Poppy is our, our youngest um, that we got four years later. Uh, we were able to pick her up from the hospital too and bring her home, which was like, you know, it's just really special. And I, we, I felt like we were even more prepared because to hit the ground running um, because we had been through it before and we had been, um, parents to a baby that had gone through withdrawal and that's a whole nother thing in and of itself and so right. you know we just like we, I I knew like okay I know what stroller is the best stroller to get I know what bassinet's the best bassinet what toys to get like we really were able to take the experiences that we had and make the transition into bringing another baby into the household really easy but like I had said in the article you know having giving birth and that's a really you know special thing to do and and event in your life and I it it's just adoption is so different and it doesn't mean it's less than there were so many positives in adopting and picking a baby up from a hospital that weren't part of childbirth that I think so many people don't think about like I said you know when you give birth you are physically exhausted you've been exhausted for months you know as mm -hmm. you're in your last trimester and you know you could barely walk and your feet are swollen and all of this stuff and you're, <laughs> yes. and you're tired and when we had our daughter we came home to a house full of guests and I hadn't even like figured out how to use the bathroom yet or take a shower or any of that stuff you know um after giving birth and it takes days to figure that out it, I mean it's it's just such a process and you're so tired and it hurts to even move nobody talks about that it hurts to get up it hurts to move it hurts to breastfeed and you've got guests coming over and they want to see this new baby and you feel like you're hosting people it's over and you're hormonal and nothing fits and all of these things <laughs> when you pick a baby up from the hospital I remember even especially in preparation for picking up Poppy because I'd been through it before several nights before picking her up I was like getting a full night's sleep because I was like you know I'm gonna have a newborn baby I want to make sure that I'm well rested um and you you're up and running it doesn't hurt to walk you can run into the bathroom come out you're it's fast everything is fast and so you can enjoy those moments with the baby so much more because you are not in physical discomfort that's distracting you or making you feel drained. You feel like I 
I had plenty of pep in my step. And that makes such a difference when you're caring for a child and not just one child, but then several other kids. I can't imagine how it feels to come home from the hospital, having given birth, having a newborn, and then having other children on top of it. So not only did it make the experience the best for us, not just only for me physically, but also for the rest of the family, because I was no problem. Sure, I can get you something to eat for this one, and I can wash that one's hands, and I can help mm -hmm. that one in the bathroom, because physically, my body hadn't been through anything, and hormonally, I wasn't dealing with emotions, and I was well rested, and, and the first couple of weeks of having the baby and getting up, same thing. I, I, I only had to worry about her medical care, not mine. And mm -hmm. it made it, I don't want to say more enjoyable because you can't really compare the two. There's such different experiences, right. but it, it made it more enjoyable than I ever thought that it would be. And I was like, wow, this is really, yeah. this really is a fact that nobody talks about that really has great benefits to it. And right. we were able to thoroughly enjoy our company when they came over to see the kids. I didn't feel like I didn't feel uncomfortable driving. I didn't feel uncomfortable sitting down. It was just, it just made the experience really nice. Yeah, we able, yeah. We were able to give the girls, you know, a much better part of us because we were more wide awake and just prepared for it. Yeah, oh, that's, that's such a good uh, point, Jack. And uh, yeah, that's something that people don't realize. And for those people um, who have a biolog biological child, I mean, you're able to, compare the two because oftentimes you can. I have friends who had a had a, have an adopted child and then they had a biological child and now they're having their second. And so they have that rich experience as well to have, you know, that um, that that beautiful generosity in their lives. But so one of the things I want to ask you is about your Catholic faith and belonging to a St. Francis of Assisi parish, which is such a lovely parish in Long Beach Island. I mean, it's right on the water. It's just so beautiful, such a loving, welcoming community. So in what ways was your parish community um, a good support system for you? Well, first of all, my mom has worked for the diocese for over 50 years and specifically in St. Francis for uh, 42 years, more than 40 years. And so I literally grew up there. It wasn't just that I went to church there, but when I tell you, I literally grew up in my mom's office, playing in the pool when she had meetings. Like I grew up there and I know the priests and the nuns and the parish staff like family. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's like family to us there, not mm -hmm. just because, but it's been where actually both of my parents worked. And so when we brought our... First of all, they knew that we were going to be adopting. And even the nuns in our parish at the time was Sister Kate. Unfortunately, she has since passed. And Sister Pat, and she's still around. Um, they were at my baby shower. They were every day that I was at going to St. Francis. They're like, when's this baby coming? I mean, everybody in the parish was invested in these the baby that we were going to be bringing home. And when we brought um, Jade home first and one of the first things we did was go over there to visit my mom at work. That's where my dad worked to see them, to see all of our friends that were priests and nuns. Everybody immediately fell in love with them and welcomed them. So it was just such a nice sense of community in that Absolutely. You know, same thing. Like when you're pregnant and, and you have your friends and family around you anticipating the a birth of a child, it's really exciting. And, and, it was the same experience with them. They were anticipating these children coming into our lives and they open, you know, welcomed them with open arms. And it just, it wasn't, I feel like I should just say this as well. It wasn't just St. Francis at the time. Um, my oldest daughter, Emily, she went to All Saints um, Catholic School in Manahawkin. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And Sister Jeanette and the staff. I mean, from the moment I brought Jade home, they were like, bring her into the school. I mean, Jade was, she was in Sister Jeanette's office on day one, getting stickers and prizes and being treated like a princess. And they, same thing, they immediately treated my kids like family. They were excited to have them there. And so both of those places were like second homes to us. And just, John, yeah. Really like another grandfather. yeah, yeah. Father John Krampus is like another grandfather to our kids. Yes, and I just had the privilege of meeting him 
But that, yeah. you know, that experience of being part of a, a church family, as we say, the church is a family of families. And that experience is common to so many of us Catholics. That's why, so when we, we prepare engaged couples for marriage, we'll say to them, you need a support system of people who share your values, of people who will love you no matter what, people who will support you in good times and in bad. I mean, we can't do it alone. We, we can do it, obviously we do it with, with God's grace and God's love and God's support. Um, but that's, that support of loving God comes through loving people in your community, those loving people that care for you. And so uh, that's just a beautiful, I, I think of this community of people kind of wrapping their arms around you and embracing and adopting in a, in, in a very real way, adopting them just the way you did, you know, and, and they become part of the church family. And that's how Catholic parishes are. And so we so encourage um, all of our couples to find a parish home, even if it's not your local parish. I mean, that's just such an important thing. So, um, so I want, I really want to thank you for sharing this amazing story. And um, you had such courage, both of you. And I'm sure that um, it's something that you never could have predicted the, the day that you were married, you know, that that's, of course, an act of faith too. the day that you marry each other, and you have no idea what's coming. And so that's so beautiful. So I just want to ask you, um, as we uh, kind of finalize our discussion here, what would you say to families, especially young couples who are having difficulty conceiving, you know, infertility is such a big problem in today's world, whether it's regular first time infertility or secondary infertility. Infertility is, um, is a growing concern. It's affecting something like one out of six couples. And so um, what would you say to, to families who, who are kind of contemplating or thinking about adoption, but they're afraid, thinking about foster parenting, but they're afraid, what would you say to them? Well, I get those comments or questions all the time. You know, some of the top reasons why people are hesitant to foster and or adopt is, um, and I always have an answer for all of them when people say them to me is, um, one, it's not my kid, am I gonna bond to it? And my answer is always, when you pick up a baby that is looking at you and needs you, you immediately bond to them. Like, all you know is that child is looking at you and seeing mom. So why would you see anything less or different when you look at that child? But I can say that, but until somebody experiences it, they just don't realize. And you don't have to worry about the bonding aspect. It will come and it will come very, very quickly. Um, when you pick up that baby from the hospital and you bring it home and that baby's looking at you to feed it and to change it and to give it, you know, love and security. It happens so quickly. Um, and so not to worry about that. Um, some other questions that we get or why people are like, oh, I don't know if I want to do it is, you know, they hear stories about foster care and, you know, children returning to their birth parents and that happens. And that is a really hard pill to swallow. And our Jade, for it took years for us to finalize her adoption. And there were definitely periods where we thought she was going to be returned to her birth family. But the reality is, is that, A, when you go into foster care, you can make it very clear to the division what you're looking for. You're looking to just foster. You're looking to just adopt. There are like 10,000 kids in the state of New Jersey that are available for adoption already. Sorry, Molly, it seems like you have um, muted yourself or your, your microphone mute, just went mute. Um, okay, that's better. Okay, so you were, you were at uh, ad adoption. Um, right, so um, people are concerned about fostering and the chance that, oh, I hear all the time from people, oh, I could never give the kid back. Well, the reality is it's not your choice and it's, when you choose to foster, and it's just like when you have a birth child, you don't know how long that child is going to be in your life. You don't know what, how that's going to end. And, you know, things happen in life. And, I, you know, I know people personally that have children, have had children, and unfortunately, they've lost them and terrible sadness has come. And when you choose to foster, you, you hope to be able to adopt and that would be fantastic but sometimes that's just not the plan that's put in place 
And you just have to have faith that what's meant to be is meant to be. And the reality is, is that that moment or that time that you're going to be in that child's life is going to affect them for the rest of their life. And you have to keep that in mind. It's not about you and what you want to just, you know, have this kid to keep for yourself. They're a person and whatever their path is going to be is going to be, but they're is a high likelihood that you can still adopt from foster care. And it works out mm-hmm. for people all the time. You just have to be clear with the division from the get-go of what right. your expectations are and how to get there because there are different tracks. And another question or issue that people bring up all the time, it drives me crazy and I feel like I can understand why they say it, um, but I feel like I have to address it. And that sure. is, well, when you adopt, um you know well what if they have problems and they being clearly like special needs well is there any guarantee that you're going to have a um a birth child that's not going to have any special needs um i'm sorry my son has to step out for a second no problem (laughs) there's no guarantees in life that you will have a biological child that is going to be perfect. And what does perfect even mean? Like, I, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see a perfect child. I have no idea what that is. Um, I like to use the word typical, typically developing. But until you have a child with special needs, you'll never know like the real gift that it is. And I don't know any parent that has a child with special needs that's either adoptive or biological that doesn't think it's the best thing in their life. So the whole idea of like, well, I want a biological child because then I know there won't be anything wrong with it. Again, there's no guarantees in life. No, no. In all the years that our kids were in occupational therapy and physical therapy and all those things, I would see so many different parents in there whose kids were typical, nothing wrong with them. Something randomly happened. They got in an accident. Their whole lives were turned upside down and that quote unquote perfect child was no longer perfect. Um, And I just think that, the child that you're meant to have is the child that you're meant to have. And then if you're thinking about adoption, it's because maybe it's the path you should go on. And there are so many wonderful kids out there that need a home. That but, is, I mean, I just couldn't. That's right. That's right. You're, you're so right. And this is, again, this is such a wonderful, beautiful thing that you've done and you have a, a beautiful family. Now you're, you're role models. Well, that's what the sacrament of marriage is that you are witnesses. You're, you make God's love present in the world. And you do it in a really special way with your beautiful family. And so I wanna thank you both for sharing your story, for sharing your advice, for sharing your encouragement about something that there's a tremendous need out there. So if you feel called, I mean, you really need to, This you, perhaps you need to say yes. Perhaps you need to really pray about it, but it might be that yes, that it, God is calling you to. So. So again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Get back to that amazing, wonderful family. All these videos will be available on our website. Everything's available at www.dioceseoftrenton.org slash natural dash family dash planning. So thank you once again and good night. Have a wonderful night. God bless.